Welcome to Central Community. It's fantastic to have you with us today. Hey, big playoff day for football and a great day to be in church. I'm talking about money today. I only talk specifically about money once a year. So if you're tuning in and you never want to hear a thing about money, great time just to turn it off right now. But if you want to know the blessings that God has for your finances, this is the message that you don't want to miss because it won't be again until next year. So you want to be around for this today. Welcome to Central Community. Thank you for your part in us reaching the community. Join us for worship. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the goodness that you've applied to our life. We thank you for this beautiful week. And as we come now, we thank you for this next day in our life. We thank you for the opportunity and what lies ahead for each and every one of us. We ask you to be with us at every step of our journey today. And so, God, we thank you. And now we upload and we give you those requests in our hearts and our lives right now. We give you the desires. We give you the, the questions that we have, and we're listening to what you have for us today. We're looking for answers, God, and we find them in your love and your goodness. And as we go through this day, help us and guide us, protect our family and our friends. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for the people in Riverside today. We pray for all the people in California and all across our nation and all through our world, God. And we know that you are so big of a God that you know each and every heart. You know each and every person by name. And Father, we thank you that we can be called your children. And so help us in our relationship with you. If we need something, help us to ask for it. If we desire something and we want to dream, we know that we can go to you and we can find those dreams in our hearts and our lives. And so guide us, protect us, be with us now. Be with all that are sick and ailing right now and help their lives. Thank you for blessing us now. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. so much you guys we've had a problem in our courtyard over here now probably 20 years ago or 22 years ago we built this beautiful courtyard in between our buildings and we spent a lot of money on it to make it an attractive place for us to get together in the evenings in the summer and have barbecues and picnics for us to hang out we've had weddings out there we've had funerals out there during the pandemic when they allowed us to meet outside we had church out there and so we've done a lot in that courtyard across the years but during the pandemic, there were kids who weren't in school, and so high school kids and college kids really got to know our schedule well. And so at nighttime, they also began to enjoy the courtyard. And they would come when no one was here. They would party there. They would smoke dope there. They would drink. They would just have a great time there. And then we would come in in the morning, and Pastor Ken or Debbie or someone would have to clean up their mess. And, they, cause they, and whenever I would catch them, I would come in sometimes at 12, 30 in the morning, on a Monday morning coming back from Jackets for Jesus, or sometimes just showing up at work and they would still be there, someone passed out or whatever's going on. And I would say, you know, if you guys would just leave and clean up your mess, we wouldn't even know you were here. It wouldn't be a problem at all. But they wouldn't clean up. And so a couple of weeks ago, I saw that there was a security camera for sale on Costco normally $159 for $79. And you know, Pastor Eric's great deal of the day. I had a tough time passing by that security camera. So I could sit out there. Now, I know many of you probably have a ring doorbell or a security camera at your house, and you're used to this. But Pastor Ken hung that thing up there, and we got it connected to my smartphone through the miracle of the internet. I was able to go home last night and I was able to watch my phone, and I found myself doing something that I've never done before, and I've wondered when I've seen other people do it, why in the world they would do it. Sitting in my chair and looking at the courtyard, thinking, ooh. Sitting in my chair, listening, pushing the sound button, and thinking, hearing cars drive by in Phoenix Avenue. I can hear the cars drive by. Oh, look, I can watch the cars drive by in Phoenix Avenue. I can see the entire courtyard. And it somehow made me feel just a little bit omnipotent. I mean, that I was able to, from a camera from the building, to overlook and keep an eye on everything. And then you think about God for a minute, who God 
keeps an eye on everything, God who is in everything, God who is in all things at all times, and our lives where we kind of party and we make a mess and we don't particularly worry about cleaning it up. And yet God is watching us. And he's not from a distance, but God is in the very real, very here, and very now. We're closing up the entire series that we've been talking about on being ready for 2022 for a new life. We started off by talking about cleaning house and how important it is. We need to go through and clean house. We talked then about what it is to make changes and how challenging changes can be for us, especially the older we get. Last week, we talked about cheering up and just how essential it is for a witness that we just cheer up a little bit, lighten up a little bit. And this morning, I want to talk about letting go. Because it's one of the things that every single one of us is going to do someday. People will come to me occasionally and say, you know, Pastor Eric, if I die, I would like you to do my funeral. And I'll say, you know, that's not an if question. I mean, that's a when question. And not an if for all of us. We're all going to die. And we're all going to let go at some point. But the trick for those of us who follow Christ Jesus is learning how to let go way before we die. Learning how to let go and let God. And it's one of those expressions that sounds trite, but it's true. That until we legitimately let go and let God move in our hearts, let God move in our lives, let God move in our finances, we can't experience the blessings that God longs to give us. So from 2 Corinthians, fifth chapter it's on the back of your card that should be there on the, or it's on the screen if you just want to read along from your screen this morning paul writing to the church at corinth remember the church at corinth corinth just literally an hour away from athens by car if you were to go there today modern day corinth is still there sits on an isthmus where all ancient traffic had to pass through and even still today modern traffic it saves them 258 miles going all the way around the peninsula if they go through it. So there's the Isthmus of Corinth that goes through there. This great four-mile canal that cuts through and allows people to go through. You can imagine what it was like 2,000 years ago, how important this was to them to save this treacherous journey by boat, 258 miles, or just to literally lift up a boat and carry it across. And so it was a city of wealth, city of hedonism, the city where just everything goes completely. And now Paul's writing to the church that's been planted there. These people that have had no time for God, so close to Athens, a two-day walk back in those days. And here he writes to them, says, we were sent to speak for Christ, and God is begging you to listen to our message. We speak for Christ and sincerely ask you to make peace with God. Some of you in your translation may have learned it this way, to be reconciled to God means the same thing. When you're reconciled, it's making peace. To make peace with God. And yet many of us, we've done nothing but allow barrier after barrier to build up in our lives that separates us from God. Think about your life. What barriers have you put up that have literally kept you far from God? And so today I'm going to talk about the three primary ways that we give to the church. Whether it's through offerings or commitments or the tithe. And three of the biggest barriers. Now, are there more than these three? <laughs> Absolutely. Way more. But these are the kind of umbrella three. That almost everything else can be squeezed within. So on the front of your card this morning, it says there are three personal barriers we break when we give to God. So if you want to break these barriers, if you want to get through them, if you want to say, you know, I really do want to be closer to God. Because what does it say about Paul? He says, says, we were sent to speak for Christ. Now imagine every single one of you who professes to be a Christian, any of your friends who listen to you, this is what they're thinking. They're, okay, this is what Christians think when they hear you open your mouth. Because they know you've gone to church, they know you've professed to be a Christian, and so when you open your mouth, they're immediately thinking that you're speaking for God and all of Christendom. 
And for us, we need to find a way to get through those barriers. So the first personal barrier we break when we give to God is judgment. Because you know how Christians can be and how the church can be. They can be so what? Judgmental. They can be so judgmental. They can be, oh man, I don't want to be involved with anyone like you. People like you just, isn't that a thing to say, people like you. You're just not welcome in a place like this. And which one of you, when you started going to church, didn't come in and think to yourself, yeah, I don't feel so comfortable here. Because there were people who were looking at you and were judging you. That judgment, you see, offerings, when we begin to have offerings, they open our eyes to others. What's an offering? An offering is just when you see something good and you think, you know what? That's a pretty good thing. I'd like to give something to that. You see someone on the side of the street, a homeless guy. I'd like to give that guy five bucks. You see a kid selling Girl Scout cookies. You know what? I'd like to give 10 bucks for that. I wrote about um, St. Pray Parlos Ninos, our orphanage this week. I'd gone down and I'd taken rice and I'd taken a, just a whole collection of stuff, toilet paper, all the things that I felt were necessary for that week. I had carried down with me. And then I asked them what they needed. Here I had this great offering that I thought was perfect. And they said, well, what we really needed was laundry soap. What we really needed was dish soap. What we really needed was some pine saw to wash the floor. I said, what about food? Yeah, what we really needed was some canned tuna. What we really need, and they went on with this list. And I'm thinking, I didn't get one of them. What we really needed was powdered milk. We sent out money for food every week. When I was a kid, we knew dad was broke if there was powdered milk. So I am judgmental about powdered milk. I said to them, I said, buy milk fresh by the gallon. I said, how much is a gallon of milk down here in Tijuana? They said, about $3 a gallon. I said, I'm paying more than that in the States. I said, you know, just buy bread. No, no, powdered milk is so much easier with the kids. It stores easier. It's just so much better. And I, so I immediately had this judgmental attitude based on my personal history and my likes and dislikes. See, these offerings begin to open our eyes to others when we're just willing to give and let go from the love of our heart. So the first thing I did when I got back was I wrote an impassioned plea to my friends saying, hey, these are some of the things they need at Sampre. Some of my friends have been talking to me about, you know what, I can buy some of that, Eric, no problem. If you're willing to take it down, you bet, I'll take it down, you buy it. It begins to eliminate the judgment in our lives because what happens when we give is we're starting to build relationships. What happens when you ignore that need that your heart speaks to just a little bit and you're thinking, you know, someone should help them. You know, when you think someone should help them, that's God saying you. <laughs> that's God saying you. And it's kind of like we duck like this every single way we can to kind of get out of like a boxer in the ring, kind of like, man, I keep getting punched. You know, someone should let someone else do it. Man, I'm helping somewhere else. And for us, when God speaks to our heart, it's time for us to have an offering. It says, no one, no one, this is Jesus speaking, by the way. No one, and no one is a good one to circle right there. Just so you get that, when Jesus says no one, does that exclude anyone? I mean, no one, that means everyone's included on this. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. What did Paul say? We were sent to speak for Christ. He knew exactly what his commitment was. He knew exactly what he was supposed to be about. My commitment to this funny little security camera that's on my phone it is not deep as enough. <laughs> Saturday nights, Debbie and I usually watch a movie together. And so we went home and our daughter-in-law told us about this movie. I think it was called Ron Gone Wrong or something, a cartoon, very cute. Anyway, we were, we were watching this cartoon last night, old people watching the cartoons that their grandchildren watch, you know. And so we, we were there watching it. And the whole time, my phone was going, bleh, 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 and it was sending me little text messages saying someone was in the courtyard. And I wasn't paying any attention to it because my mind was all on what was happening in Wrong Gone Wrong. I mean, my mind was on everything that was happening in the movie. I had turned away 
from what I was supposed to be doing. Now, in my mind, I was supposed to be with Debbie watching this movie. But I knew that in the moment I had set up this camera, I mean, I had this higher calling on my phone, and I thoroughly ignored it. It's so easy for us to have a primary focus in Christ Jesus. It's so easy for us to know that invitation of, yeah, I know that my heart gets strangely moved for an offering, and then to just ignore it and to turn away because Christ just constantly speaking to us. But we're focused on our stuff. And so we miss out that. I love what John Wesley said, probably the most famous message on giving in history. He says, work all you can, earn all you can, give all you can. Work all you can, earn all you can. And that's about the part we get right usually right there. We stop right there. We stop right there. Yeah, we work. Most of you have been very successful at working all you can. I'm guessing your lives have been filled up to here with work, more work than you knew what to do with. Earn all you can. Most of you have done what you can to get that next promotion, to get that next job, to get that next whatever. But it's that give all you can that we're out of balance with. It begins with just a simple offering. And that offering breaks down our judgmental attitude as we begin to build relationship with each other. The second personal barrier we break when we give to God is greed. And all of us struggle with greed. All of us battle with that desire to have just a little bit more, and when we get it, to hold on to the little bit more that we have. It's that greed that we battle with until it begins to occupy all of our lives. And the way we begin to abandon greed one day at a time, because that's the way you learned greed. You didn't learn greed all at once. Watch a little kid. A little kid will have lunch and give away their whole sandwich and not have anything left. We learn greed. Now, make sure not to give away your sandwich, Johnny. You need to make sure to eat your sandwich. That's why I packed this lunch for you. Okay, well, Mom told me not to give it away. And that's not what Mom intended was to teach greed, but somewhere along the line, we begin to hold on to ours for us. And then we say things like, you know, to take care of your own house first. That's in the Bible, isn't it? Us four and no more. That's in the Bible, isn't it? None of that's in the Bible. We need to break the barrier of greed, and we do that with commitments, because commitments begin to take us outside of ourselves. Commitments say, you know, I'm going to take this next step beyond myself, when those of you who committed, along with the rest of Central Community, to go and build at Siempre para los Niños, and not just build a house and say, here's your house, here's the key, and walk away from it, but instead to build an orphanage. We really were clueless that an orphanage required people committed to it 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We've got a staff down at our orphanage working right now. We've got a staff at the orphanage at the church, working right now, getting ready for them to have church and them to have Sunday school for our children and for the children of the colonia. All of that happens. That's happened because people committed to say, I will stand by it. And as we all learn through that difficult learning curve of, wow, this means always. And it's a good thing that the name of the place is Siempre para los Niños, always for the children, because it's been a constant reminder that this commitment wasn't just once. And I look at the children that you know, came to us when they were infants, and I watched them grow up until they're seven and eight years old. And then one of our kids who came to us when he was maybe seven years old, Neftali, we got a wedding invitation for him. He's getting married now. We've got other kids who are married and have children who have grown up who came to us way back in 2004 and 2005 because people have been faith faithful to their commitments. When you make a commitment, it begins to break the barrier of greed. Would there be a lot of other things to spend the literally millions of dollars on that Central Community has given down at Siempre para los Niños? Absolutely. Could we have put that little security camera up a lot sooner? You bet if we just ignored it. But how many hundreds of children now have come through Siempre para los Niños? 
how many hundreds, if not thousands, of people have attended the church down there during this time, have been baptized after they gave their heart to Jesus, have received communion, have been married. Sadly, some of those who worked first, were a part of our communion down there, have been buried during COVID-19 and gone to know the Lord because there were people who made commitments and who kept their commitments. This is what the scripture says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It's just the truth. Some people have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. What did Paul say that he knew about himself? We speak for Christ. In your world today, you speak for someone. Your friends who hear what comes from your mouth, you speak for someone. Do you know that you speak for Christ? One of the ways to constantly reaffirm that is with your commitments. It begins with the offerings that just break our hearts open for generosity. And then it goes to the commitments that begin to shatter the greed in our lives. The kids who were partying here last night, it was a funny thing that happened. I had been watching this movie and about 45 minutes went by and I looked at my phone and there were all these notifications on my phone that there were people moving around in the courtyard. And I said, Debbie, Debbie, there's someone in the courtyard. I can't believe it. Now, mind you, it's my very first night with the thing. I didn't know anything about it, so I clicked on one of them, and sure enough, there they were, sitting in the corner of the courtyard. They were partying, they were eating, they were drinking, they were having a good old time. And, I, and Debbie says, Eric, say something to them. Turn on the little speaker so you can talk to them. Tell them to get out of there. Tell them you're calling the police. I didn't know what to do. I remember Pastor Kenneth said when he put it up, he said, this is God. You know, just tell him, this is God. I didn't know what to do with the speaker, you know, because I could hear what they were doing down there. I could do all of that. They're having a really good time right here on the church grounds, defiling that which is holy. And instead, there's a little button on it that you can just push that says siren. And so I pushed the button that said siren, and suddenly, and it's got this however many decibel siren that's going out through the darkness. And I could watch exactly what was happening. It was recording as all these kids took off running and jumped over the fence and kept running and trying their very best to get out of here. They ran so fast that Ken said they left their mail behind for their apartment right next door to the church. They ran so fast they left all their candy scattered across that Debbie cleaned up this morning. They ran so fast that their drinks were tipped over on the courtyard out there. They just took off knowing that they had been caught. Imagine getting to the end of your life, abandoning everything, because it's not like you can take anything with you, and then just finding out that you've been caught. You've been caught short without generosity. You've been caught short without commitments. You've been caught short with a barrier between you and God. And it wasn't God's fault, because God has been giving you every opportunity to come and build to come and love, to come and commit, to come and be generous, to come and have offerings. And we held back. And we allowed our judgment, we allowed our greed to control us. I love the little quote there. And I actually tried to search, out, search it out because this quote is attributed to so many different people. The oldest version of this quote that I could find, though, is Victor Hugo. It says this, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. True or false? So true. So true. You can give without loving. But ask any grandparent. Once you start to love your grandchildren, I don't think Debbie started shopping online, not until the pandemic, but until she had grandchildren. And she would start shopping online and say, Oh, that would look so cute on one of the girls. Oh, this would be perfect for them. Debbie, they've got more clothes than they know what to do with, sweetheart. Yeah, but this would be so great. You see, she's got both the generosity of a grandparent and she's got the commitment to her grandchildren and she just can't help but give because she loves them in the same way we loved our children. Except maybe better because we can send our grandchildren home. But it's really wonderful to be able to have that opportunity to love. When you love God, you can't help but give because you're in love with that which God is doing. 
in the world. It's no longer a struggle for you. It's because it's a joy. You want to be about what God's about in the world. And it's what we're called to. And finally, the third personal barrier we break when we give to God is disobedience. And to be honest with you, I think this is the biggest one we all struggle with. Disobedience. And that's why God put the tithe in place. The tithe, tithe just means 10. It's a really ancient word. It just means 10, and it talks about us saying that we belong, and so we give. When you belong, I mean, if we don't give, how do we know if we belong? If you belong to a country club, you have to pay to get in that country club, and then you continue to pay to give. You say, wait a second, well, Jesus paid the price for me. And that's absolutely true. Jesus paid the price 100% for you, the price that you could never pay on the cross so that you could be a part of his church. And in his church, we have the opportunity to be faithful, to break the barriers of our disobedience. God does not need your money. The last thing God needs is money. The old saying, you can't take it with you, is true. But the other saying that God doesn't need it, that's true also. God has everything. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. And everything that is ours, it's his as well. But we have the opportunity to break our disobedience and become obedient to God. Scripture going all the way back to Leviticus, and literally, you can teach the tithe. People will say to me, you know, I don't know if the tithe is... New Testament teaching. You can literally teach the tithe from Genesis to Revelation. Today I'm teaching it from 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, but I want you to know that I've been teaching these messages once a year for decades now. And every year I try to teach it from different texts because you can teach it all the way through the scriptures. The tithe is God's invitation to us to say, I want to lay down my disobedience, but possibly among the most famous texts is this, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And that's why when it talks about the tithe, it says, return the tithe to the Lord. See, the tithe is that which has been entrusted into our household. What was Paul's last plea to the people? Make peace with God. Make peace with God. But what do we have a tendency to do? We have a tendency to find every way we can to finagle our own faith outside of peace with God. And then we wonder, why aren't I happy? Why am I struggling? Why am I battling with this? When I know I want peace. God gives it to us in a way that we can embrace it all at once. We can start having offerings. We can start having commitments. We can start doing tithes, or we can take it one step at a time. We can begin with offerings, and, and our hearts will begin to open with generosity. We can step into that next commitment, and our hearts begin to see other things build and grow and step into the tithe. God, there is nothing that I want to be a barrier between you and me teaching on tithe, the tithe for so long, one of the things I've learned is not that it's just greed or disobedience or judgmental attitudes. One of the main things I've found is fear. I'm just afraid. One of the main things I've found is lack of trust. You know, I'm afraid because I don't trust that God really will do what he promised. The most famous text on the tithe is on a little commitment sheet inside your program this morning. And I hope on your screen at home as well. It's from Malachi, the third chapter, verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. It says this, Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. What's the prophet saying? He's saying, <laughs> you're separated from God. This is not a good thing. But if you return... I'll return to you. We've been given another chance. But you ask, how are we to return? God says, will a man rob God, yet you rob me? 
But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and in offerings. You are under a curse. The whole nation of you. Ever feel like our nation's under a curse? Ever feel like the whole world is under a curse? Now imagine if suddenly people put aside their judgmental attitudes. Imagine if suddenly people put aside their greed. Imagine if suddenly people put aside their disobedience. And imagine if it began with people saying, I want to be a part of what God's doing in the world with tithes and offerings. We would say, yeah, that would be great if everyone did that. But we always think, yeah, everyone else. I mean, we struggle with starting with us. And tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Here at Central Community, we don't have formal membership. We tell people the same thing. When you come to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you're a member of Central Community. You're automatically a member. So whether you're watching at home or whether you're sitting here in the church today, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's not my job. I don't watch the giving throughout the year. I see like on one week, well, barely enough to make payroll this week, or I see, you know, wow, praise God, we had a wonderful week, a wonderful month of giving. I don't see all the names, I don't see all of that. I see it once a year when I sign the giving records. And they go out. That's, I don't check up on it. I, I deliberately made this decision at the beginning of my ministry that I don't want to judge anybody who walks in the church by how much they might be able to give or not give, or who tithes and who doesn't tithe. I could never know who tithes. I don't know how much money anybody earns. Because I would have to know that to know whether or not someone's tithing. And so it's not my business in that regard. But we offer everyone this opportunity to be able to say, I want to be a part of Central Community, and I want to take that next step. And so this commitment says this, a biblical plan for our finances. The concept of tithing has been the method of financially supporting the church and its ministry on earth since the beginning. Tithing means returning 10% of one's income to the storehouse, the place where one receives their spiritual strength, the church they attend. Contributions to missions and other organizations would be considered offerings or commitment, donations beyond the 10% tithe. Today, if you do not tithe, you are encouraged to practice the biblical principle for the next three months. Does it mean tithing's only for three months? No. Remember what God said in this thing? It said, test me now in this. And so what we're laying down is a test that you can test. For, this is the only place. In fact, in the Old Testament, in the, in the um, Ten Commandments, God said, thou shalt not test the Lord thy God unless it's about money. Here he says, test me now in this. He says, if today, if you do not tithe, you're encouraged to practice the biblical principle for the next three months. First, you decide to commit the first 10% of your weekly income to the storehouse. Then, 90 days you bring that portion of your income to the storehouse. After that 90-day period, if it has created a financial crisis or you did not receive a blessing, your money will be returned. I've been doing this for 30 years or more, and in all those 30 years, one family has come and asked for their money. This is the way I always try to imagine if someone ties or not. When I'm signing the giving records at the end of the year, I think to myself, I wonder if they really could live on 10 times that. Because 10% that would be their tithe. I wonder if they only make that much money. I wonder if that's the kind of challenge they're dealing with in their lives. And I'm able to pray for them. That one family, I remember when they asked for their money back, it wasn't enough to go to Disneyland. Not for the whole family. I mean, for one of them to go to Disneyland, hardly. And I thought to myself, yeah, they didn't complete what God asked them to do. So the requirement, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Someone always asked me, is that before taxes or after taxes, Pastor? I have no clue on that one. I don't know. I, I believe it says bring the first fruits, the whole tithe. So for Debbie and me, what we've always done, we just tithe right off the top. We worry about taxes afterwards. Don't think that's God's business. That's, that's between us and Caesar on that one. And so we go ahead and we just say, you're, you're dealing with taxes. You're probably much better at it than I am. I'll let you deal with that one between you and God. The response is not test me now on this. Give it a try. That's what this 90 days is doing. If you've never given it a try, give it a try for 90 days. The reward 
I will open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. I've not ever met anyone who said to me, Pastor Eric, could you pray that I not be blessed? Pastor Eric, could you pray that, in fact, that there would be a curse on my household and a curse on our nation? I'd like to be separated from God. No one ever asked me that. But there are people who struggle with taking the simple steps that Scripture lays out for us to break down those barriers. And so for me, for Debbie and I, I already clicked that we already tithe and I already put our names together, and then I'm guessing Debbie will fill out one of these once because Debbie and I, when we first started tithing, it was quite the fight in our household. I had grown up in a house that tithed. Debbie didn't. Debbie made more money than I did. And I was like, Debbie, okay, we were 25 when we rededicated our hearts to the Lord. We were already making pretty decent money. I was like, Debbie, we need to tithe. And she was like, you feel free to do with your paycheck what you want with your paycheck, but you leave my paycheck out of that, you know. And it was an ongoing battle for months. I'm not talking about for days or weeks or this Sunday or that Sunday. I mean for months. But this is what happened when Debbie saw the blessings that came out of that. Debbie started with offerings and then with commitments, and pretty soon Debbie, yo, honey, don't give so much to all these other places. You know, I mean, we don't need that. We're tithing, sweetheart. You don't need it. But this is what I've discovered. People who tithe, they're the most generous people you're going to meet, just the truth of the matter. Because they're also doing offerings, they're also doing commitment. They're doing it. But I may not have mentioned the barrier that you have in life. And so on the back of that card, on that commitment sheet, it says, my personal barrier to experiencing the fullness of God's blessing is. And right there, it may not be greed. It may not be judgment. It may not be disobedience. You know you better than I know you. You can just write right there whatever it is, your personal barriers between you and God. And then what I would invite you to do today, if you're watching from home, you can mail that in. You can email it to me. You can message it to me. And Tuesday morning is February 1st, which means we start our month of prayer. What I commit is during this month of prayer, every morning for everyone who commits to tie, I'll be praying for you. I mean, I will have your name before me. As I pray, I've been doing it for 34 years, opening these buildings. Last year was a hard month of prayer. I kept it up for the first 14 days, and then on February 14th, I was in an automobile accident where my loving car was totaled. I, I loved that car. It was totaled, and my back was injured, and I ruptured six discs, and the next two weeks, I wasn't able to come into the church to pray. It was, it was a challenge for me personally to have to miss that. But I look forward to forcing myself down here early, to opening the doors. I'm glad we've got a security camera outside now that I'll know if someone's going to sneak in on me during that time. But I also look forward to praying for those of you. Because this is what I want for your household. This is what I want for your family. I want God's blessings. I want God's blessings to be pressed down and running over because they spring from a generous heart, from a heart that sees the needs that I, you go to places that I don't go. You see needs that I don't see and commitments to those things. And from a heart that says, you know, I want to never allow disobedience to separate me from God. And you've committed to tithe. Let me pray for, pray for you this morning and let's get started with saying, God, I want new life, new hope real change, to clean house, to let go of that which I've been holding on to in 2022. Heavenly Father, right now we come to you and we thank you so much for the good things you've given us. We thank you for the many times you've spoken to our heart just to make an offering of some sort. Maybe it was a guy in a corner. Maybe it was a kid selling Girl Scout cookies. Maybe it was someone in our school, someone at the church. And we just had the opportunity to, to undergird and support them and to be a blessing for you, Christ Jesus. We thank you for the times you've given us to be a commitment, God. I think about Siempre Parlos Ninos and the children that are happy, that are healthy, that have survived this brutal movement of COVID that came through the household these last few weeks. And that everyone's alive, everyone's healthy. 
I thank for everyone who supports them through this and the, not hundreds of thousands of dollars, but millions of dollars that it's taken to do this across the years, God. I would ask you bless the households that have made that commitment. And Lord Jesus, for those who have tithed and kept the doors of the church open, and for those who are making first-time commitments to tithe right now, where in their household it might cause some discord, where the struggle for that 90 days that test me now in this is going to be a challenge. I would ask right now, Holy Spirit, that you would make a way. When Satan throws down roadblocks and barriers before them, I would ask that you would break every barrier, that you would push aside every roadblock, that they might make peace with you, God, that they might be reconciled to you in everything they say and everything they do. We thank you, God, for the good things you've given us. I thank you and I praise your name for Central Community, feeding so many across our community, reaching into the heart of downtown LA, touching the children of Tijuana who have been abandoned, Father, and shepherding the flock here at home. Lord Jesus, I would ask that you would continue to build your church here, that you would continue to undergird us and make us exactly who you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much. Remember, if you're here this morning in person, you can just take and rip that bottom part off and on the offering plate. I believe it'll be sitting at the back two back there and you want to drop it in, just drop that in. I want to be praying for you in the month to come. If you would like to join us in prayer during the month of February, the doors are open every morning at 5.30 for the entire month of February starting Tuesday morning. You're welcome. You're invited to be a part of that. There will be communion available during that time as well. You can come and you can pray as well. I want to make sure that you're familiar with the announcements that we have for the week to come. So here at Central, Co Central Community, the 10 a.m. service is where we have our children's ministry. You're inv invited to be a part of our children's ministry. If you have kids, grandkids, if you want to be a part of the leadership over there, Tricia and Darlene do an incredible job over there, you can do that. Jackets for Jesus always is inviting volunteers. If not for Ron and Patty and Evelyn and Jody, it would be difficult for us to keep going for Tam, for the others who come in early. Ellen Buckingham's been coming in early. For those who are coming in and serving, may God richly bless them. You're invited. You don't have to go to the streets. You can show up around 4 o'clock and just work over at the kitchen. I don't know what they're making tonight. I have no clue, but I'll bet it'd be good, and I'll bet they'd let you help. You can come out, and if you'd like to come to the streets with us, you're invited to come to the streets with us tonight. Women's Bible study is at 10 a.m. 10 they're going back to 10 a.m. coming up. You're invited to be a part of that. Food preparation and distribution. The packing team meets from 10.30 and 11.30 a.m. on Tuesday mornings. You can come out, be a part of the packing team. The distribution team's on Wednesday morning. Pastor Ken's here at 5.30 to 5.45 every single Wednesday morning. Josh and Marty told him last week, now Ken, make sure to save some stuff for us to do. We'll take care of it. And I, they got here, I guess, around 6.45 and Ken already had everything out there. If you want to help out with getting stuff out, you're going to need to get here ahead of Ken. But then hundreds, hundreds of people are being served every single week. And so this week we have the opportunity to serve the community. Again, in that regard, Siempre para los Niños. If you'd like to go out and buy some pine saw, buy some tuna, buy some laundry detergent, I don't think it matters which brand, buy some dishwashing soap. They don't have a dishwasher, just plain old dishwashing soap. Any of that stuff, just bring it by the office. I'll take it down Wednesday morning and it'll be a blessing. May God richly bless you and your household in the days to come. Thanks so much for being a part of Central Community this morning. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are high. Our God is greater, our 
Healer, awesome in power, our God. 